Bonjour tout le monde, bon après-midi. Hi everybody, hope you're doing fine in the middle of the fantastic Congress 2018 in Regina. Je suis Guy Laforêt, président de la Fédération des sciences humaines du Canada et je suis heureux de vous souhaiter la bienvenue aujourd'hui. I'm pleased to welcome you all here this afternoon for the Big Thinking Lecture. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which we gather to hold Congress is Treaty 4 land, the territories of the Nehiowak, Anisinapek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda nations, the même que la terre ancestrale des Métis. We're grateful for the hard work and preparations for the week undertaken by our Congress host and partner for the Big Thinking Lectures, the University of Regina, and we thank them and the indigenous communities in Regina for welcoming us here. Comme lors de nos euh, voire grands précédents au Congrès, j'aimerais vous signaler que nous aurons un service, que nous offrons un service d'interprétation simultanée et que vous pouvez vous procurer des écouteurs dans la salle qui est située à l'extérieur du théâtre. Je veux remercier nos partenaires globaux pour les séries voire grands, le CRSH, la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation, de même qu'Université Canada, qui nous aide à parrainer l'ensemble de la série. Toutefois, pour aujourd'hui, nous avons un parrain spécial, c'est-à-dire la Fondation pierre Elliott Trudeau. Hier, uh, yesterday I was mentioning that in 2019, we'll also celebrate the 50 years of the Official Languages Act, and this will coincide with the 100th anniversary of the birth of Mr. Trudeau. It is uh, thanks to the generosity of these sponsors that we're able to enjoy these events open to the public for all to enjoy. Today will be no exception. We're delighted to welcome Madame Marie Wilson, who will ask us a challenging question. Can diversity serve as an agent for ongoing reconciliation needed to address historical failings? Je voudrais maintenant demander à Jennifer Petrella, directeur du contenu et de l'engagement stratégique à la Fondation Trudeau de venir nous présenter Madame Wilson. Jennifer. Merci beaucoup, Guy. Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue. So I actually have two introductions to make uh, this morning. Guy, I hope that you're prepared for this. So the first is to the public personage that you all came here to hear. And the second to is a person I've come to know since 2014, a woman of courage and authenticity, who has made a mark not just on me, but on Indigenous uh, people and on settler Canadians from coast to coast to coast. So let me begin with the first introduction, and here I borrow liberally from the excellent text produced by the Arlen Speakers Bureau. Marie Wilson served as one of three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, following decades of experience as an award-winning journalist, trainer, and senior executive manager, including many years as a regional director for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, in CBC North. Bilingue en anglais et en français, elle a été professeure d'université, professeure d'école secondaire en Afrique, gestionnaire senior pour des sociétés d'État et consultante en journalisme, évaluation de programmes et gestion de projets. Dr. Wilson was appointed the 2016 Professor of Practice at uh, the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill University, and she's a 2016 mentor for the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. In addition to awards for writing and journalism, she is the recipient of a CBC North Award for Lifetime Achievement and the Calgary Peace Prize. She has received six honorary doctorates, as well as the Meritorious Service Cross, the Order of the Northwest Territories, and the Order of Canada. <clears throat> and now for the second introduction. I've known Marie since the spring of 2014, and what I've learned in that time is that she is a person of exceptional empathy and exceptional resilience. She crisscrossed the country receiving some of the most painful testimony we have ever known. And she received this testimony not at a superficial level, not at a level of bureaucracy or data gathering, but at a level of profound humanity, at a level of resonance. And this is something that few of us could have sustained for long. And yet Marie sustained it, not for a month, not for a season, but for month after month, for season after season, for six and a half years. Furthermore, she did it on a punishing travel schedule from her home in Yellowknife, not the easiest uh, city to access in Canada, where she had family and a community that counted on her for a lot of hard work. So how'd she make out? I can only tell you what I've observed. And what I've observed is that Marie Wilson is beloved. 
Policymakers respect her, conference organizers admire her, but the people who have interacted personally with Marie, who've told her their stories, who've listened to her responses, who have interacted with her on a personal level, is that they love her. Why do people love Marie? To distill the answer to its simplest form, it's because Marie cares about what happens to them. She respects and honors us in our vulnerabilities and in our strengths. And she stands up for us again and again, whether or not she's acting in her official capacities, whether or not there are witnesses nearby. You've come here to hear Marie Wilson, and I won't uh, belabor this point anymore. But I do want to share one story with you that's not been told. In the winter of 2016, Marie, as I mentioned, was at McGill. She was teaching a course. Um, it was a busy semester for her. McGill is also um, up the street from the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of professors, uh, lots of demands from students. Um, it was also a busy semester because Marie, even though that she was finished her job as a commissioner, she continued to crisscross the country. Whenever somebody would ask her to talk about the TRC's call to action, she would try to go because she felt it important to keep the momentum going. Yet Marie didn't want to go home at the end of a very, very busy semester without having done her bit to help reconciliation in Montreal. So in May 2016, she solicited a meeting with the mayor of Montreal at the time, Denis Coderre. Now, anybody who knows Denis Coderre knows that this is a very busy man. He was mayor of one of Canada's major cities. He had a number of international uh, initiatives going on. He was busy from morning to night. But Marie spoke to his assistant and she said, I really don't want to leave the city without having at least 10 minutes of her time, of his time. So the assistant came up with a proposal. She said, listen, um, there's such and such a date. Um, he's going to be moving from engagement number one to engagement number two. You can be waiting in a dark corridor in some dingy hallway behind a nasty venue. And, um, you know, he's going to breeze by and you can catch him. And at 10 minutes 01, he'll be gone. Marie said, okay. I don't know exactly what Marie said to Denis that day, but I do know two things. The first is that before that conversation, Montreal had no plans to advance reconciliation, neither with respect to the TRC's calls to action nor with respect to anything else that you might imagine might be appropriate for that land. And yet, the second thing I know is that a little more than a year after their conversation in the dark, dingy hallway in some unknown venue in Montreal, Montreal had adopted UNDRIP, so the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples, and it held a public ceremony during which we unveiled our, our city's new coat of arms, in which the traditional symbols of Montreal's founding people, so the, the rose for the English, fleur de lis for French, um, four-leaf clover for Irish, and thistle for, uh, for Scots, had been added to. So now if you look at our coat of arms, you'll find right in the middle a white pine, which symbolizes the indigenous people who were here on, or who were on Montreal Island long before the Europeans set foot. In addition, the city, um, the city announced a number of new initiatives. So uh, they hired a commissioner for reconciliation. Uh, they publicly committed to educate our councillors, our city councillors, to forge links with indigenous communities, to rename streets and public places, and to undertake a number of other measures that the, uh, that the commissioner might uh, recommend. So let me close with this. Marie only lived in Montreal for four months. Her work there was largely anonymous, one professor out of many. And as I mentioned, the story I've just told you has never been told. But Marie left her mark on my city, a mark that I suspect will last for decades, if not generations. She has also left her mark on our country, and she continues to do so with modesty and with courage, even as she challenges each of us to leave our mark also. Ladies and gentlemen, Marie Wilson. Ben, bonjour tout le monde. Je pense que j'ai jamais eu une euh, présentation de, de même. Vraiment, hein. c'est très touchant, Jennifer. Merci beaucoup. I don't even know what I did wrong. What could I have done that was so wrong to make them abuse me the way that they did? I was just a little kid. It took me a long, long time to realize that they didn't punish me for anything that I did. They punished me for who I was. Those are the words of just one of the residential school survivors 
who spoke to me about his experiences as a child in residential school. I heard them in my previous capacity as commissioner, and those words came ringing back to me several months ago when I got the invitation to speak at your Congress with its theme this year, Gathering Diversities. And if you'll allow me an attempt, Mama Wini Totan Nanatok Ayisi Yiniwa. I hope that's sort of close. Those very same words prompted the description I've given for my remarks today, that our positive national image as a diverse country follows a century and a half of public policies and educational omissions aimed to wipe out diversity. In most of the past 150 years, diversity has been a very double-edged sword, a lens through which to differentiate and segregate those who are different, and a justification for assimilation through mainstream institutions, including academic institutions, in an effort to wipe out such differences. Today, with rapidly changing demographics and waves of immigration over the past decade, we are talking about diversity today with a very different meaning, about inclusion of the other in political discourse, about socioeconomic advantages of diverse workforce. But in the midst of this new, more politically comfortable, I would say, conversation, we must not forget that the words I have shared with you were only spoken a few years ago. They were spoken by a relatively young person with a memory of childhood experience still fresh in his mind. And they were spoken not by someone who came to Canada from somewhere else, but by someone who experienced such exclusive traumas right here in his home and native land, his own home and native land. They didn't punish me for anything that I did. They punished me for who I was. I heard those words right here in this province, in fact. And so I'm particularly happy to be back here to share with you some of my thoughts related to them. And I want to acknowledge, as has been noted, that we are gathered on the unceded territory of Treaty 4 First Nations, the traditional keepers of these lands. I do want to acknowledge Jennifer Petrella of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation for a very exceptionally kind introduction. And I especially acknowledge this Congress and your President Guy Laforet and the Foundation such a huge gathering you are of luminaries, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and students. I put myself in the category of practitioner, most recently as commissioner and university professor, but as you've heard also spending much of my previous career in various aspects of journalism. My very first job as a news reporter was right here in Regina at the Leader Post newspaper. And at the time, I didn't realize the irony of my very first front page story. It was about the, the Pepin Robarts Commission. And a few of you may be old enough to remember that that commission was about national unity, English-French unity. Against that backdrop, while the two officially recognized founding nations we're trying to figure out how to get along together. The Gordons Residential School was still in full operation in this province and would be for almost another 20 years. No matter what Robarts and Pepin were doing, the lives of seven generations of children from the other unrecognized founding nations of Canada, the Indigenous peoples, were being marked forever by that residential school experience. So let me take a moment and walk you through a few slides to ground you fully in that residential school story because I've spoken enough places now to know that there are always those in the room who are quite well familiar with it and want to learn more and still those who are still coming to it for the very first time or barely scratching the surface. So I'll tell you a little bit about the TRC. I'll share with you some of our broad conclusions about reconciliation. I want to offer you some reflections on diversity as they relate to reconciliation, and then to leave you with some thoughts and hopefully some hopeful notions about the next generation. 
So let's talk treaty commitments and constitutional recognition, or lack thereof. Residential schools were not a good intention gone wrong. Residential schools were a broken promise, violation of provisions of treaties by which Canada had bound itself. And most importantly, residential schools were an attitude. Far from embracing diversity, they were a presumptuous and self-serving government policy based on attitudes of racial, intellectual, cultural, and spiritual superiority. A European father-knows-best approach to dealing with the First Peoples of this land, some of the oldest civilizations on the planet. By now, many of you may have heard the fundamental words of our first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. They're worth hearing again. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. And so it unfolded in huge numbers, 150,000 children, approximately 150 schools, over approximately 150 years, if you count those schools that were already in place through the church's pre-confederation. Residential schools provided for the official and intentional separation of families, forced assimilation based on attitudes of, forced, of racial superiority, and prolonged isolation of little children in conditions where they were vulnerable and unprotected. Well, those children grew up, and so the legal context kicks in here, because in massive numbers, they worked their way before the courtrooms of Canada to make claims on what had happened to them in school. The biggest single defendant was Canada itself, together with four national churches who ran the schools on contract to the government. The complex court settlement that came out of it provided for several things, but many have said that the most important of these, in fact, was the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because it would be the vehicle where the children's side of the story could be put on the record. We had three big jobs with our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and so it was a forum where the voices of the children could finally be heard so that we could successfully document the complete history and legacy of the schools. Where healing could begin as we shared with each other what had happened and began to challenge ourselves about what needed to happen next. Where the country as a whole could be educated, could listen, learn, and begin to respond with new ways of living together. And in which the rich diversity of Indigenous peoples could be understood, honored, and respected. We put the survivors squarely at the heart of our work. After all, they were the ones who had gone to court, they were the ones who had fought for the commission, and they were the ones who paid for our commission with their court monies from their settlement agreement. Nothing we did was more compelling than what the survivors themselves had to teach us. And you may not realize that so much of what they said touched on the issues of race, identity, diversity and inclusion, the very matters that we are considering at this Congress. I lost my innocence, my childhood, my family, my identity. I didn't know where I fit in. I was told my parents didn't want me, that they were unworthy, that they were pagan. We were taught to hate the Anglicans because they were all going to hell. My parents practiced traditional ways. They did sweats and things. So they put this bracelet on me, and I had to wear it in front of all the other kids, and they laughed at me. That bracelet said, Pagan. I used to eat all of those communion hosts, trying to get that paganness out of me. I hated being Indian. 
I hated my parents. I hated their brown faces. I hated the smell of their house. I was ashamed of them. I tried to pass myself off as Italian. It was just so much easier to get in and get by. They thought I was Chinese and I went with that because it was easier than being seen as Inu. I didn't care who I hurt. I didn't know how to love anyone else. I didn't know how to love me. I didn't know how to take care of me or anyone else. I hated white people. I hated everyone. I hated myself. Well, I think we were right in thinking the country needed to know about this, and we know that we are just scratching the surface on that ongoing work. You are in this room, but thousands and millions of other Canadians are not and have never been. And so that puts a responsibility on all of us as to what we do beyond this room. We tried to invest in that public awareness. We were in 77 communities. We held seven major national events, one of them here in Regina, in Saskatoon, uh, sorry, in, in Saskatchewan, in, in Saskatoon. And we recorded over 7,000 statements from the 80,000 survivors who were living at the time of settlement. So that's approaching 10%, and it's the biggest single canvas of public opinion on Indigenous issues ever in the history of our country. We tried to make connections and to make people feel safe by putting intentional effort into making space. Our national events all had a theme, and they were based on the seven grandfather teachings known in many cultures, or the seven sacred teachings. Respect, courage, love, truth was here in, in Saskatchewan. Humility was Montreal. Honesty, and we ended with wisdom. Those national events we thought would possibly start with a bang and peter out, but the opposite happened. They grew in numbers. And by the seventh one, where 10% of the participants had been non-Indigenous at the first event, 60% were non-Indigenous by the seventh one. Things just kept going. And the same with the young people we brought together through Education Days. And I hope my town will allow me to share a little bit of that with you in a moment. We had the resurrection of traditional ceremonies and beautiful ceremonial welcomes. And I'm, I'm glossing over these uh, for the sake of time. But we also welcomed expressions of reconciliation and challenged people to think about what could they commit to. I know that the city of Regina here is a member of the Association of Municipalities. That association made pledges on behalf of the national organization and cities like Regina and others have made their own promises of specific things they will do and are doing. Um, we also reached out to people registering the fact and hammering the fact that this was not an Indigenous story and this was not Indigenous history. That this was Canada's story, our history, our laws, our policies imposed on Indigenous people and that reconciliation belongs squarely to all of us. You can see a number of prominent people here, some you may recognize. Um, in the middle is one of our former Prime Ministers, Joe Clark. The far right is my co-commissioner chief, Wilton Littlechild, you may know him. Sheila Rogers of CBC Radio fame is beside him. Our chair, Justice Murray Sinclair, in the colorful vest. I'm just beside Mr. Clark, a slightly different shade of color, I think, in that picture, uh, hair color. Beside her, um, beside me, is um, Sheila Fraser, our then um, uh, Auditor General, and the former head of the Canadian Human Rights uh, Association, Barbara Hall, longtime mayor of Toronto. But also we had people from within government, uh, the now deceased Andy um, Clark beside, um, Andy Scott rather, was a former minister of Indigenous Affairs, who was one of the first to acknowledge, I was in charge of these things and I knew so little about it. And then beside him, as we had many people from oppressed communities, Robbie Weissman, who was here in Saskatoon, who was a, a survivor of Buchenwald, who was a child survivor of the Holocaust, who said, when I listen to residential school stories, I hear my story and could see the connections. I can tell you more about that later, um, but I will tell you that the amazing Buffy St. Marie from your very province here, 
who will be on stage tonight, is also one of our honorary witnesses and one of the last ones we had the honor of inducting. What they did was made promises to do their part, to keep the story alive, to teach others, to broaden the circle, to invest further in ongoing reconciliation, understanding it not as a moment in time, not as a project, but as a movement. Well, we summarized our thoughts about all of this in our TRC final report. And relative to today's Congress theme of diversity, our report makes something very clear. And that is that in one sense, we already have a lot of diversity in Canada. In fact, we've had it from the beginning. Diversity in how we treat Indigenous children in the child welfare system compared to non-Indigenous kids. Diversity in the amount of money we spend on Indigenous education. Diversity in the length of sentences that go to Indigenous offenders. Diversity in the length of time served before parole is granted. Diversity in access to health care, to jobs, to opportunities. Glaring diversity in the measures of hopelessness, suicides, murdered, and missing. We have lived legally sanctioned, separate, and inequitable lives. We have not grown up together. We've been raised and educated in oblivious ignorance of each other in this country. Unskilled and sometimes unkind in how we speak to or about each other. So that now we face the enormous challenge of trying to reconcile with strangers as we endeavor to embrace diversity. Today, in contemplating the positive meaning of diversity, we need, also need to confront ourselves with rigorous honesty about the ways we have organized our lives, our communities, our governments, our resources, and our institutions in ways that have made one group of people so disproportionately unwell, unfulfilled, underserved, and underrepresented. We talk about all of these things in our 10-volume TRC final report, and we've pointed out ways to begin digging ourselves out of these realities in our 94 calls to action. Ways to change the educational, institutional, and socioeconomic landscape of our country. You're all implicated in that work with your own role to play, whether as individuals or as collectives. And since we're in a university setting, I would like to believe that by now you have all at least read the 94 calls to action. And if not, that has to be top of your to-do list leaving here today. There are things that you can do and there are also things that you can influence. Or there are things, there are people that you can hold to account in your role as citizens. We've grouped our conclusions in areas which have everything to do with the social sciences and the humanities, child welfare, language and culture, education, including early childhood education and parenting, health and ongoing healing, but also justice and the law with a particular focus on the relationship between addictions, poverty, and the criminal justice system, fetal alcohol effects, missing and murdered Indigenous women. We've talked specifically about the Métis, a very important chapter in this province where your Métis population is very prominent and vibrant and important. And we've also devoted a full chapter to the North. I want to tell you that that holds particular both heartache and hope for me, as I've now lived well over half of my life in the Northwest Territories. And I know personally many of the former students who spoke to our TRC, and some of them are from my own family. Indeed, one of them lives in my own home. But the North is less well known to many of you, so I want to dwell on it here for a moment. And it has great inspiration to offer because so much has happened in such a short time and we can hold on to that hope. In the early 1980s, I was a newlywed in a place called Fort Good Hope, Radelikon, which is just below the Arctic Circle on the Mackenzie River. And in that community, in the mid-80s, it was pre-television, pre-running water for all houses, including our own, pre-reliable telephone services, much less internet, and you could count the number of vehicles in town on two hands. Much of the adult population still headed out of town to fall and winter trap lines and hunting camps and summer fish camps. Fresh vegetables arrived every two weeks and disappeared in about two hours. 
The airport was a short gravel strip just off the middle of town, lit up from the sidelines when necessary by the, headlines, the headlights of skidoos. The key powers of the territorial government were still in the hands of unelected bureaucrats appointed by Ottawa. An entirely white government bureaucracy and their families who had literally been flown in and transplanted from Ottawa on a government chartered aircraft just 15 years before. And no one had yet begun to say a single word about the single biggest and longest running human rights violation in the history of our country, the residential schools. We're all living under the veil of a secret that was eating away at individuals and communities. That's what it was like there. So many people drowning in their own sorrow. And in my own professional lifetime, I've seen all of that shift, dramatic changes in the development of this part of the country, from the services and facilities available to the very nature of the territory itself, with its unique consensus form of government. No divisive party politics, consensus decision making in our public government. The redrawing of the map of Northern Canada, not done by Ottawa, but negotiated by Inuit and Dene indigenous leadership to peacefully create the new territory of Nunavut. What has made the big difference? I would point to three monumental things, and I know there are many little things. The first was Justice Tom Berger's inquiry into a massive gas pipeline create, and he, that created the first ever opportunity for Northern Indigenous voices from remote and disconnected communities to be publicly and widely heard. Secondly, elected Northern Indigenous leaders moved into positions of authority and decision making, working side by side with non-Indigenous colleagues, no longer beneath them or not in the room at all. Do you know that eight of the last nine premiers of the Northwest Territories, which is a public government, have all been Indigenous? Thirdly, I mentioned the negotiation of massive Aboriginal rights agreements, confirming ownership, cultural certainty, and economic possibility to, to, to Indigenous peoples on their traditional lands. And fourthly, I come back around for thousands of Northern children highest number per capita in the country. Those who had been raised in isolation from their homes and families and silenced by the circumstances of their institutional residential school upbringing, I have witnessed the slow but steady reclaiming of their voices and their lives. So now let me tell you briefly about my recent experience designing and teaching a course about the TRC at McGill. It was magical and eye-opening in so many ways. And one of my assignments that I dished out was the dreaded group assignment. <laughs> and I know it is universally understood as the bane of all keeners who feel the group is gonna drag them down and the salvation of all slackers who hope the group will save them. <laughs> well, I, I put a twist on that assignment. I told them that they would be graded in significant part on their group functioning in the spirit of reconciliation. It has to start somewhere. Not only did they have to be mindful of it, they had to document it, and they had to describe for me the practical operational ways in which they had ensured that all members of the group were valued and active participants. Without exception, the group reported back to me that this had been the hardest and most beneficial part of their assignment because they had learned so much from and about each other. And then in their reflective essays, many told me that it was the first time in their four years of university that they had ever knowingly been in class with Indigenous students. It was their first time to be invited to experience social subject matter on an emotional level and not just in their heads as an academic issue their first time to realize the importance of applying emotional impact and human impact to determining public policy, and the involvement of those who will be directly affected by such policies. Here's what one of them had to say. 
I wish to embrace reconciliation by acknowledging in my daily life my participation in society as a treaty person. I will encourage others to learn more about Indigenous peoples and Canada's colonial history whenever possible. I sincerely hope that the TRC is the beginning of a turn of the page in Canadian history. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action by calling clearly and succinctly for decisive changes throughout Canadian society also illustrates the current situation as a lack of all the things called for. I am still unsure of my place in all of this. Reconciliation for the moment means working on making myself the kind of citizen worthy of sharing this land with the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples who share it with me, my family, my community and my fellow settlers. This can mean holding back to listen to myself and others, and it can also mean stepping up and acting when the time is right. It is a lifelong process of learning that I am glad to have begun. My students' words underscore what I see as a compelling point about diversity, that it can only be narrowly measured in statistics. It is far more richly measured in institutional or organizational culture. Diverse presence, inclusive voice, mutual transformation. As a commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I listened to over 1,500 stories myself. We received almost 7,000, and I can assure you that no two were the same. I say that because I want to say to you, please do not get tired of hearing about this and learning further about it. Make efforts to recognize the expertise in your midst. There are survivors in every region of this country. Become aware of and celebrate the extraordinary individuals in your respective regions and communities who have survived broken or stolen childhoods and gone on to lead and achieve extraordinary things despite the odds and create ways for others to also know about them so that they can be inspired by them as the heroes that they are. But there's more that I'd like to say, but I want to finish with just one last comment, because I know that what I'm asking of you and what I ask of myself on a daily basis takes great and continuing courage. We need the academic knowledge and professional skills at this Congress today, and we need boundless courage and I want to encourage you in it. The revered poet Maya Angeli said so powerfully, without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. We can't be kind, true, merciful, generous, or honest. I think our kids get that. I have one little story from my granddaughter that I like to share in the discussion period if time allows. And I have a video that perhaps when we're all done, if there's time for a little three minute video, I'll include that. But I know that I'm to time for now. And so I just want to say that we are all in this together. For those of you who don't know about this, hurry up, catch up, get yourself caught up. There's huge work to be done and we need to all roll up our sleeves and work at it together with good hearts and our best efforts. Masicho miigwech. Merci beaucoup, madame. We have time for questions. This is our third big thinking. Uh, I'm looking at the mics. They're the best so far. This is an inside joke. I'll tell you later. Uh, so you just go uh, on either side, and give your names, and engage in uh, a dialogue with uh, madame Marie Wilson. While you're being prepared, I will ask you one question. What was for you the turning point? in leading towards the kind of work that you are doing right now. Is there any personal experience or anything you read or lived that sort of transformed you and made you the kind of advocate you are right now? 
Well, um, as a journalist in the North, and as I said, we had the highest per capita number of residential school students. My husband went to residential school for eight years. I will tell you that I did not know that for the first 15 years of our marriage. Never talked about it. And then once he named it, it was a headline only. It was a long time before he was able to talk about the details of what happened to him. And it was a crisis. It was a crisis in our home. It was a crisis for him. I, I, with his permission, I can talk about these things. So that was really that, uh, what brought me to full awareness of the situation. And as it turned out, our entire extended family, including his mother, which he did not know till she was 75 years old, that she too had gone to residential school. So the veil of secrecy tied in with the, 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 the story of rampant abuse because don't tell anyone was one of the living threats or no one will believe me or kids tried to tell and they got further punished or all kinds of variations of that sort. Uh, there was a lot of secrecy, but I knew it because in a way I was living a version of it in our home as a spouse and as an extended family member. In terms of the work itself though, because I'll just add, there was a moment that was kind of a pivotal moment, not just for me, I would say for all three commissioners, and I would say for the entire health support team that traveled with us. And that was at a hearing, one of the earliest public hearings, it was in the far north, it was in an Inuit community, um, tiny community, um, very restricted, um, facility, so we were crowded into a tiny little community hall. It was packed standing room only. And what I just want to say about it is, um, this was, I think, hearing number three. At some point, someone said something, and the entire room started wailing. The translators were crying. The uh, media were crying. All the staff, it, everyone was overtaken with it. And we could hear people out in the community outside. The reason I say that was a turning point is because it was what really underscored for me something that my husband had said in such an understated way, which was this. Make sure they understand the enormity of it. The enormity of it. I don't think there was a health support worker in that community that day those who had been going in and out of there for months and years, some of them, on one-on-one -on -one counseling, had any idea of the enormity of it. And that's what we as a country have to realize. We have to get over our impatience and dive into it and realize the enormity of it and keep asking ourselves, what else can we do? What else can we do? And keep asking, who do we need to be talking to? Who else needs to be part of that conversation? Dr. Wilson, thank you so much. I've heard you speak before, and it's an honor to hear of the work that you've done. Um, and your name is? My name is Kathy um, from the University of Alberta. Uh, I see a lot of really important action being taken at the university level. I'm proud to see what's happening, but I also know that sometimes things happen in waves. Idle no more looked very exciting to me. So I'm, I'm seeing some continued energy, um, some deeper understanding, but from your point of view as an outsider to that process, how do you think universities are doing in terms of responding to those calls to action? Well, I am an outsider to it, so I have to give quite a qualified response. I am aware of major uh, resolutions that have been passed by the Association of Universities of Canada and I'm aware of some really significant work that is being done in specific universities. I'm sure I have blind spots about some also good work being done other places, so I don't want to suggest that it's missing. But I do know that in every sector of society, what I observe is that some great things are happening, but it's not consistent. And there are still great gaps, um, geographic gaps, um, jurisdictional gaps places where a lot is happening, other places where a little bit's happening, places where things are happening under the same name but it doesn't have anything close to the same quality. So for example, in curriculum, to have coursework where it is an entire new course curriculum, an entire standalone course, a must-have course, mandatory for all students, essential for high school graduation, which is what we have now in, in the Northwest Territories, is not the same as an essential uh, page or chapter that you must read 
in an already existing book, um, which your teacher may or may not park on for more than five minutes. You know, it's uh, the, the degree of, to which teachers are being prepared, carefully prepared, because this is hard work and it's very um, disturbing work. Uh, the degree and care with which teachers are being prepared to take that on, I know varies. But I know that good things are happening, and what I always say is we are inching forward. And that's the direction that we need to be heading in. The question we all have to ask ourselves is, what am I doing? And if the answer is, I'm doing nothing, then there's your answer for who needs to do something next. That's what I'm. Okay, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. Uh, my name is Haley Heavy Shield, and I'm from the Blood Tribe in Southern Alberta. And I'm the first generation in my family not to attend a residential or day school. And um, it's been my life's work to um, the journey of reconciliation. Uh, the biggest part, I think, for me, um, when we talk about intergenerational trauma, is the loss of language. And so right now, I'm teaching and learning um, stories of the land and my own language and um, you know ceremony and cultural practices that are so very important to our youth um, particularly those um, you know that have not been brought up um, with their culture because of these um, residual effects of residential schools so I just wanted to say thank you um, for the work that you're doing um, I've been seconded from the Alberta Teachers Association and uh, it, it was a result of this project of walking together, walking for uh, education for reconciliation was a result of the calls to action. And um, in Alberta, we're working with, um, you know, the university deans, uh, the colleges, um, and uh, the TRC to, to try to educate educators um, towards reconciliation. So I'm quite proud of the work that we've done in the last two years, um, and I just wanted to thank you. My one quick question is, um, you know, with the commission of the missing and murder Indigenous women, there's a lot, uh, many people that are feeling frustrated with the progress, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are or what maybe your, maybe some encouragement in, in how that's taking place and or what needs to take place, sort of modeling uh, what you've done with the TRC. Thank you, Haley, for your comment and your question. First, if I may, on your comment, um, well done on what you're doing, and that's, that's so great. Um, for all of us, to be attuned to the fact that one of the things that's going to be coming forward is federal legislation related to uh, Aboriginal languages. And as citizens, can we not all take on the responsibility in making sure that our respective members of parliament are not the ones that are going to try in any way to block that, and that we are going to have um, support for something that we heard countless times was one of the biggest losses and one of the pathways to reclamation and healing and a sense of well-being and identity and belonging. Um, so good on that. On the other commission, yes. Yeah. As I say, these are not indigenous issues. It may be official language status for Aboriginal languages, but that is what Canada has. And so we should all be holding and advocating for that. Um, on your second point, I don't want to say a lot except to say this. Um, commissions are unique each in their own way. Ours, in ways that I had to skip over, was very unique in the world, actually, because it, was, it came out of a court settlement. It was an obligation put on the government. The government was not the good guy that said, hey, let's have a commission. They were the defendant in the court case. So we were a post-judicial instrument. And we had a lot more latitude, I think, in many ways, a lot more independence to do things the way we felt we could. We also had a longer timeline, so we had time to figure out, I can assure you after that hearing that I told you about, we made adjustments to how we did our work, how we prepared ourselves, how we supported ourselves. Um, we had the time to revise because there was no rule book. There never is a rule book for any commission. You, you, you get one, not because something's great, you get one because something's gone terribly wrong. 
And if you're lucky, that very wrong thing didn't happen before. So you're trying to invent something at the same time as you're trying to do something. And it's like building your car and driving it at the same time. It's, it's really hard. Um, it's also really difficult subject matter. Um, and you don't have a team, so you're trying to... It, it, these are, they're hard commissions, they're hard jobs. I, I don't want to make a comparison. Um, I just know that the thing that we learned that I think was most important was engaging as early as we could, as well as we could, as meaningfully as we could with the communities affected and to, try, and to stay true to the survivors, to make sure they stayed at the heart of our work. Uh, uh, my name is Bourgeau. Bourgeau. And um, I, I have a question coming from Cindy Blackstock um, and a commentary she made on the last federal budget. But for the benefit of this audience, I would, and you know, just a point of information. Um, it has to do with the historic relationship between South Africa and here, leading up to apartheid and after apartheid. I was with a Métis organization, I'll do this quickly. I was with a Métis organization in Saskatchewan and we were um, researching Métis scripts and other issues back in uh, Trudeau Senior's time. And I stumbled across a file in uh, then known as Indian Affairs. And it was uh, about, uh, it came to be about the relationship between South Africa and here. It goes back to the uh, Boer War and before. Um, during the Boer War, the Canadian government, Lord Strathcona, Donald A. Smith, recruited a, into his Lord Strathcona uh, light indigenous soldiers from the Battlefords. They were sent to South Africa and they revolted and were sent home. The reason they revolted that's indigenous and Métis, is because what you're doing here in South Africa, you have done to us in Western Canada, and they wouldn't fight anymore. The relationship with South Africa, I'm doing it quick, goes right back to post-Red River Rebellion, where some of the actors in the early treaties then went to South Africa, engaged in the treaty process on behalf of the British. South Africa, after the Boer War, up until the 1960s, sent many delegations here to Canada. And one of the, what they were, one of the issues they were looking at was the residential schools and how they were managed here. This is, uh, and especially, apartheid South Africa, post-World War II. With, with your permission, sir, I'll just interrupt you, 15 seconds. We have a couple of other people. Okay, the well, I'll just end with that. that. They, they looked at the residential schools. The question I have, what your thoughts are, Cindy Blackstock said, after the last federal budget came down, what is needed in Canada is equivalent to a Marshall Plan somebody's better start thinking about what to do economically for people, indigenous people, to raise them to the same level as everybody else in this country. But well, the I, South Africa connections there. Yeah, I, I'm, I, the, first of all, on the reference to the Marshall Plan, I've actually said that publicly myself in speeches for many years now. So I agree with it. And it, the, the recognition that we're not starting with a level playing field We've devastated communities, and there's need for an infusion of resources before we can even start to build up in some of the, and, and not all communities are in the same circumstance, but some are. So I agree with that general principle um, and have spoken about it publicly before. Um, the comparisons with South Africa are many. I, I've heard Cindy speak about this before. Um, and there are other things that are very, very different about our commission and that one. Um, but the principles of human rights violations are common. It's a variation on a theme of uh, human rights violations. Thank you very much again, um, Marie, for helping me today. Um, I've been very privileged to And your be, name, sir? Oh, my name's Brian Beaton. I'm at the, the University of New Brunswick. And um, I've been very privileged to be a part of this journey over the years and um, one of the aspects that I'd, I'd like you to comment about is uh, the role of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation 
and the work that the communities and the people that uh, took their started their healing journey before the TRC uh, TRC took place, and and how that got uh, supported the role of the TRC, the materials and the tools that were introduced and uh, the systems that were introduced by the people, the communities and uh, the organizations that were involved with the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, a lot of that was just undermined, like, you know, and abandoned by the government. And I'd like, like, you know, to I, I see that as a leadership role right. that the communities and the people took. If we, could, if we could have the second question, and then we'd uh, ask Madame Wilson to respond to. No, that, that's my, like, I'd just like her to respond to the role of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation and the importance of it in the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Madam? Tanze Neil Laurie Campbell, Matu Spirit, Nahio Nitipitiko Sanswell from Treaty 6 Territory and uh, currently living and working at uh, the University of Waterloo um, in indigenization or indigenous engagement area. One of the things that uh, you had spoken about was, uh, or mentioned that um, top of your to-do list should be to read the 94 calls to action. And I guess one of the things I wonder about, and uh, with my peers uh, across this country that are working in institutions in our particular roles, is how we can, um, is it fair to uh, not always have to put out the emotional labor and actually just refer people who are coming to us and are choosing not to read the calls to action for us to not have to engage with them and spend that time until they take on some of the responsibility themselves to do, uh, you know, to do some of the work. Um, because I, I think many of us find ourselves in positions where we'll have dozens, if not hundreds, of people coming to us, and if we ask them if they've read the calls to action, if they've looked at, you know, the great website and the information that's out there, and they'll say no. Um, I personally would like to start turning them away and say, do that and then come back. Is, is that a fair thing for us to be doing in places of higher education where people should be wanting to learn more? Okay. So I was just curious because you had made that comment if I would respond to that. Okay, so for I'll the sake of time, these two will be our last questions. I'm sorry, I apologize for that and you may have opportunities to talk she to might, Madame Wilson she afterwards. Might, she might be a If I give really short answers, well, I'll try for really short answers. And then, <laughs> um, absolutely on the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Did tremendous work. Uh, we wrote the Prime Minister three different times asking for the funding to be continued to the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Many of the people who came and spoke to us specifically said that it was the work of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation that made it possible for them to show up and tell their story. It, there was a direct correlation. I could say more about it, but that's the bottom line. If you look at the interim report of the TRC, we came up with 20 preliminary calls to action, which a lot of people don't remember or haven't paid attention to. And one of them was specifically about the need for more healing uh, because uh, the, 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 the death of the healing foundation, as it were, was going to be a huge problem. Uh, so I absolutely agree with you. We don't have to reinvent the, meal, the wheel. We had a tremendous model, and we should be infusing life into it, not killing it. Um, on the other point, uh, this is where I say we have things we can do and things we can influence. And I don't know exactly what your powers and your authorities are, but no one told me that I had the right to tell my kids, you have to take one of the calls to action of the TRC, and that's your group project. And the first project, the first step is agree among yourselves which one of the 94 you're going to work on. So that forced them all to read all of it, and then from there to do the, So I think to try to be maybe a bit mischievous, but also to be creative to say, how do we get people there? People are not going to read it if they don't know they're supposed to be reading it. And much as we may think on a moral platform, they should be by now. The fact of the matter is we've got a long ways to go in basic awareness. So uh, find ways. If you have the authority, make it a mandatory um, essay topic as part of your course or whatever. I don't know. I, can't, I don't know enough about your circumstance. But I would be putting my thinking cap on, saying there's not the one thing I can do. There's probably lots of things. And I would get other people in the room to help me brainstorm it and find creative solutions. 
I'll shorten my concluding speech and take one more question. Thank you. Juan Acotin. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Marie Wilson. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Emily Angulalik from Nunavut Arctic College in yeah. Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to say um, language and culture is very important for healing. And I'm grateful to, to be here and to listen to your speech, which is very, very important. Healing has to start, and healing is beginning. So language and culture uh, has to be also included in our healing. Kwana Kutin. Nakumik Marialuk. Kwana. Aha. Merci, Madame Wilson, and thank you very much to everybody. Uh, this is a token of uh, appreciation on the part of the Federation and of the University of Regina for you. Thank you very much. We are grateful to the Trudeau Foundation, the University of Regina, and all our partners for allowing us to have these big thinking lectures. Tomorrow, we'll have the pleasure to have Dr. Antonia Mayuni, Dean of Arts at McGill University and former president of the Federation, who will be discussing gender in Canada and whether or not we're really making progress. The event will take place in French with simultaneous translation available, and it is again here at the University Theatre at 12.15. There are all so many questions, so many things with regards to the universal dimension of what is going on in Canada with regards to reconciliation. We're rest of our, we have the rest of our lives to think and act upon all these things. Merci beaucoup, madame. And that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs>